All right, so uh, this is a consolidated endpoint monitoring on a shoestring budget, if that's not a big enough title for you there. Um, so uh, what we wanted to do, or I guess we get the question often, uh, how would we have caught you? Because you didn't set off any alarms when you did the pen test. How, how would we ever go about finding you in our network? And so I often, and Joff can chime in, uh, I often do not get caught by network-based detection. Um, it just doesn't really happen. Um, and so the clients that with the few clients that we have that do endpoint monitoring uh, have a whole lot better chance. So this talk is about how can you can do consolidated endpoint monitor monitoring without uh, you know going broke. Um, or you know if you just want to give it a, a shot to see what kind of information you can get uh, from uh, endpoints, there's a rich, level of information that you're probably missing if you're not already doing this. Um, and we're going to do it with uh, free and open source tools and a little bit of configuration and some duct tape, some popsicle sticks, um, and some other bailing, various, don't forget the, the yes. bailing wire, couple of beers. Um, yeah. Also, I, w I will chime in and say um, I agree with uh, Derek's assessment that we rarely actually find environments that have visibility on the endpoints themselves. And so one of our recommendations is often, hey, guys, you've got to get visibility on the endpoints. And in line with that, Derek and I are like, well, why don't we put something together that like gives people a bit of a recipe on how they can get visibility on the endpoints with uh, a shoestring budget. So enter this webcast. Yes. And so uh, I did a talk um, uh, about um, you know, earlier in June uh, on something similar with a friend uh, about uh, – doing endpoint monitoring uh, in the same kind of way. This is going to be more focused and uh, also now there are pretty graphs and charts that are on press management. Um, so real quick, um, I wanted to point out something about the value of time because just because it's open source and free does not mean that it's totally free or cost free. So if you value your time, uh, open source and uh, free software uh, the trade-off is going to be there's no one to call. There's no vendor who's going to help you fix this. It's pretty much going to be on you and the community that supports the project. And, and some communities are way better than others, that's for sure. Like the bro community I, I noticed is, is pretty good. Um, but, hey, I mean, it's the trade-off, right? But, you know, no matter what, if you're figuring it out and you're making it work and you're putting in your elbow grease, uh, your, your kung fu is going to be better for it. You'll, you'll learn a lot more for it. And, and pretty much consistently, whenever you're talking about a lot of vendors today, we've noticed, you know, people go the route of going with a commercial product because they feel like they get better support, but a lot of times their support is, you know, basically college interns who just learned how to turn on a computer, and it, it's amazing. It's like Metasploit. For the longest time, if you had a problem with Metasploit and you went onto the mailing list and you asked a question, H.D. Moore himself would answer those questions, and you mentioned the bro lists as well. So don't always think just because you're going with a commercial vendor that you're going to get amazing customer support because a lot of times it doesn't quite work out that way. Yeah, same thing with feature requests, right? You ask a vendor for it. Yeah, that's on our three-year roadmap where if it's an open source project, oh, yeah, here, just do this, right? I mean, but hey, there, there are trade-offs. Just be aware that there are trade-offs. Uh, so we'll, we'll jump right into what we're using for this. Uh, so... Uh, there's going to be an agent that runs on the endpoint. Uh, we went with NXLog, uh, which is, uh, uh, they do have an enterprise version of NXLog, uh, so you can purchase support from them. I have found it to be really, really you know, easy to run. And uh, so it's going to be an agent that, that ships the Windows event logs uh, to a central collector. Um, and we'll get to the central collector in a little bit, but that can be a, a, a syslog server or an, a, an elastic stack. Uh, and so they support uh, Windows event log shipping. And then any uh, you can choose which events you would like to send or send the entire uh, application security or, or system log. Uh, and you can send it in a variety of formats. So we're, we're going to be doing it in JSON. Um, and then also uh, the config file that's listed on that gist. Uh, so the slides will be posted uh, and you can get the config file we're using. Um, we're going to go for after some specific event IDs and then all of Sysmon. And we'll talk about uh, Sysmon in a minute. 
Um, and then additionally, even though we don't have them in the configuration that's in that gist, uh, there are a lot of uh, event logs that you may be interested in. Uh, so malware archaeology has a few. Um, and then there's the NSA spot, the adversary list. I'd like to thank my friend Troy for telling me about this. I did not know about it. Although I, I don't know, and maybe somebody in the audience does know, what is a hot patching error? I have no idea what a hot patching error is. It's got patching in the name, so it sounds dangerous. <laughs> it sounds awesome, but hey, you, you may want to look for that. We're not because I don't know what it is. So it doesn't I would almost look at it. If I had to guess, I'd have to do a little bit of research, but I'd almost guess that it would be basically where you're installing a driver on a system in runtime. Um, so it's not requiring a reboot and it basically be like a root kit. Uh, so you don't have to recycle, or somebody just said, Benjamin just said non-powering patching. Yeah. So that would be like a root kit yeah. failing to actually successfully install if I had to guess. Sweet. So now I know, now I'll add it into the, no, I'm kidding. I won't because I still don't know really, but. Um, and then there's PowerShell logging. So uh, certainly all the latest hotness in both pen testing and, and, and apparently increasingly in, in malware and actual adversaries uh, is you know, the use of PowerShell. And um, so if you don't know, with PowerShell version 5, there are some logging um, improvements that have been made. You can log the module that's run, so you, you, you get execution details of of what's being run, uh, but probably more importantly is script block logging. And so script block logging, if you run a, like say an encoded script, like base64 uh, PowerShell encoded uh, script, um, it's going to decode that and then put into the log, uh, the PowerShell log, uh, or the, the event log rather, what is actually being run. And I didn't know this until putting this together, so thanks, Joff, that it, it automatically logs stuff considered suspicious, which I like that, suspicious. Um, and then transcription, but uh, we didn't enable transcription because it, uh, that's a fire hose of, of data. And then, uh, so deploying it through, uh, deploying PowerShell logging through GPO, if you're running Windows 10, uh, you're, you're good to go. Uh, there are some caveats for getting it on, on Windows 7. Um, so if you're deploying in a Windows 7 environment, know that there's a little bit of work that needs to be done. Yeah, but nobody's running Windows 7. And if they're running yeah. Windows 7, they're surely up to date on patches, right, guys? <laughs> right? Uh, that's, uh, yeah, I, I see yeah. that all the time. I, I certainly still don't see uh, clients that haven't uh, patched uh, against the Eternal Blue stuff. Right. And and, um, and Derek, um, if, if I may make an extra mention on the PowerShell logging, uh, Black Hills has a blog entry that I wrote uh, called uh, PowerShell Logging for the Blue Team. So Google that up, and uh, I think Sierra can probably find it and maybe even post the link as well. Um, that's where some of these slides come from, so that might be useful yeah. to you. Absolutely. And now probably to the, the what I think is probably the coolest part uh, of, of this uh, duct tape together solution is Sysmon. So it's not built into Windows. If you haven't heard of Sysmon, it's part of the Sys internal suite. And, and when you install it, uh, it, it starts to log uh, a lot of data. Uh, some of the most important things um, or process creation with the entire full command line. So it was previous in Windows event logging. If you turned on, um, you know, uh, process auditing, you really just got the process, you know, name that, that ran. Uh, Sysmon improves upon that and also gives you the hash of the process, which is really awesome. It does, really awesome. It does a couple of different hashing mechanisms. Um, I think we have MD5 and uh, SHA-1 turned on. Um, and then um, the uh, uh, network connections and file creation times. Now, so you're probably thinking, wow, that's gonna be a lot of data. So the key to this is to use a configuration file when you install with Sysmon to knock down a lot of that noise. Now, I gotta give props to the Swift on security person, folks, whoever that is, uh, they, on their GitHub uh, site, or they have a configuration file with a lot of work already put in. And that's actually the configuration file that we used. Uh, so um, it, it goes and it, well, actually I have that on this slide. So it's, it's going to filter events based on the event type 
and they've already went and uh, filtered out a lot of things that are going to make a whole bunch of noise. Now, you're still going to see noise in your environment if you use this configuration file, but it's a good starting point to, to go ahead and uh, take a whole lot of uh, data out of your logs that you, will, you really just don't need. Um, you're going to find things that are running, like so I, in my lab environment, I have Google Rapid Response running. Well, I went and filtered that out on some workstations just to you know, try it out, and it, it, it works beautifully. And here's an example of uh, you know, their file. And uh, here, uh, on process create, they're excluding an entire command or an entire series of, 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 of executables. Uh, namely like the search indexer. Now, one thing to point out, if you're excluding things based on path or based on executable name, if your malware runs from that path with that name, that is a blind spot. I mean, it's something to be aware of. It is what it is. Uh, it's better to have the logging and know that there are blind spots rather than not have the logging at all. And then for our collector, uh, we're going to use the Elastic Stack uh, or Elk Stack. I'm not really sure what they call it now. I think it's Elastic Stack or Elk Stack, whatever. Uh, so Log Stash is going to ingest uh, the incoming syslog, and uh, we use Kibana to do some visualization. And uh, so a note on this. Uh, in our lab environment, or we, we have this running on a single virtual machine with a couple of machines talking to it. Uh, scaling it for an enterprise, scaling it for more machines is has to be a consideration. I mean, if you're going to use, if you have 6,000 endpoints, I don't think a VM with 8 gig of RAM and 2 cores is really going to work so well. Uh, you're going to have to uh, actually but, use hardware. But um, actually and then, try that? Do try that and let us know how it works out. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that's not going to work so well. But the great thing about this kind of solution is it has built-in clustering, right? So if you deploy it and you need more, you can just deploy an, some more hardware. So it scales. Uh, again, these are considerations like if you're deploying it enterprise-wide, you're going to have to take this into account. It has to be a project. Also, as well, like, you know, with sec security, maybe encrypting, you know, the data that's coming in, uh, you know, across the wire, not things that are in scope for this. This is really kind of a proof of concept. And uh, again, um, you know, sort of, you know, a little ulterior motive on my end. Now I have a really awesome logging server in my home lab, which really works out pretty well. And uh, so what we did uh, to get uh, deployment strategies in place was basically used GPO, right? So we talked a little bit about script block logging and deploying with GPO. Um, so to deploy NXLog and Sysmon, we also use the GPO to uh, uh, install on uh, startup or start the service on startup. Uh, so that install bat file is uh, at that gist location too. And so I know I've kind of gone through the slides pretty quickly. That's because the rest of the time is actually going to be demo time. Derek, can, can I make one comment just to add to your uh, conversation there? Um, I wanted to point out um, that uh, on the server side, on the Elk Stack side, we also do have a custom log stash configuration. Um, and uh, Derek, am I getting ahead of you? Do you want me to jump no, into a little bit of the detail no, there? That's so uh, so that so there's three just links that are in the slides. Uh, the uh, log stash configuration that you just mentioned, and then um, there's the install batch file, and then um, also the uh, NX log configuration. And so we didn't put make a just for Swift on Security's uh, Sysmon configuration because you just go get it from them. So there's four components. But you're right. The uh, the Joff put a lot of work into the uh, log stash and jester. Yeah, so let me let me just talk uh, talk to that briefly. And when you actually uh, go and download the uh, the GitHub repo stuff, uh, you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, so um, a couple of things that that come out of this, and that is, um, uh, Derek, are we are you able to put the log stash configuration on the screen for me? I am going to do that right now. That would be awesome. Um, one thing is uh, when you're ingesting the logs, uh, as Derek mentioned earlier, uh, the NX log agent on the client side is 
sending the logs with the uh, IAM Vista module across uh, the network and they're not encrypted right now. I think TLS is an option. Uh, we just didn't go down that road. Um, and it's coming over port 3515 uh, TCP and it is uh, JSON uh, encoded data. When it's received on the log stash side, the collector side, um, there is an input uh, side of the configuration that um, shows the actual codec at the top of the file. Uh, and then there's a filtering section in the middle of the log, log stash uh, configuration, which is actually relatively complex. And let me just sort of step through this so that you have a sense of what it's doing. I assume um, that that's legible, right? If it's not, I can make it bigger. It is. Make the font just a little bit bigger, um, if you would, uh, although it could be my window as well. But it never hurts to, to have bigger fonts, uh, especially if you're, you're um, matured as I am. Um, uh, so, uh, <laughs> Sam here, well matured. <laughs> well, well matured. It's like the, fine um, wine. The filter, the filter section, as we were going through this, um, I discovered that by default, if you just fire logs at Logstash, the time granularity that you get is just going to be as logs are received uh, into the ELK. It's a special field on the ELK side called timestamp. Okay, but if you want to make sure that you get sufficient granularity, what I have decided to do is make sure to customize the log stash configuration so that we always pick up the UTC time field out of whatever data is coming at us. And it turned out that it was a little bit of a challenge for Sysmon. Uh, this is Sysinternal Sysmon, Mark Rosinovich's uh, project, which is the, the custom config we have on the client side. Um, so the, the challenge was this. The UTC time field in Sysmon is contained inside the actual message text of the log message coming across. And so what I did was wrote a regular expression because, well, I just love writing regular expressions. Uh, to match the UTC time field and make sure that it ends up in the date field of the, um, sorry, not the date field, the timestamp field of the ELK stack. In other words, make sure that we have a very accurate timestamp all the way down to microseconds rather than using the standard timestamp, which only gives us down to the second. And when you're dealing with an environment where you're going to have events come at you at sub-second speeds, getting time right is extremely important. So what you see in the filter section is essentially two grok pattern matches underneath an if test and the if test checks whether the source name is sysmon and if it is sysmon the first grok uh, context here is actually creating a brand new field called sysmon event type. Now that has nothing to do with time that actually just gives me a little extra granularity in terms of visualization on the ELK stack side. The second grok uh, syntax here is actually grokking out or grepping out, if you like, with the regular expression, the UTC time field itself. And then after that if test, I have what's called uh, a date syntax here or a date keyword uh, that you'll notice a little further down, Derek, if you highlight the date block there. And what this is doing is matching the UTC time field and automatically putting it into the timestamp special field on the ELK stack. Now, UTC time already exists on standard Windows events, so I only had to do something special for the Sysmon events to grok it out. Um, if, in the worst case, we get a date parsing failure, which is the very last block here, then we'll try to grab out the event time field, which is only down to a second uh, granularity, but that would be the worst possible case. And in the experiments that we did, we're not matching that one at all. So um, it seems like it's working relatively efficiently. Hey guys, we got a quick question here. The question was, is this already up on GitHub? Uh, uh, yeah, so the log stash, uh, uh, of uh, uh, file uh, configuration file is uh, a just uh, yeah I, I just put it up there twenty minutes before the the uh, the, the webcast. 
Yeah, so I, I can so, yes. see we have a fan, I think uh, Benjamin said, perfect, this is what I've been trying to do for a while, or words to that effect. So, yeah, it did take me some time to get this right. In fact, um, I think I spent all of an afternoon uh, futzing about with this back and forward until I got it to the right place. But when you get this right, then you get your events fully uh, granular on the elk side, such that they're down to sub-second level, which is exactly what you need, right? Thank you, Joff the Grockmaster. Thanks, Ben. Okay, Derek, <laughs> Derek back to you. All right. So uh, we should probably look at another configuration file. No, let's do an attack. That's much more fun. Let's do an attack and look at some visualization. Um, so. Yeah, there's like 10 people that are like, oh, configs, configs. Everyone else is like, well, what does this actually do? Yeah, so, <laughs> like, whatever. Just I put it where and start the service, right? Good. Oh, God. Do Joff's that. doing regular expressions again. Stand back, right? So on one of my lab machines, I have uh, a spreadsheet here that uh, we're actually going to rename to totes legit because it's totally a legitimate spreadsheet that someone sent me via email, right? Um, so when I run this spreadsheet, you can probably guess what's going to happen. Um, I need to enable the content to, to view this thing. So let's do that. And some of you may know what I created this with, but... Now, back on my, uh, my C2 machine, I have a session. Oh, and I can't type. So now, um, let me make this a little bit bigger too, because that's probably too small. Enhance, enhance. <laughs> clackety, clackety, enhance. clackety, clack. If you ain't clacking, you ain't hacking. <laughs> Enhance. That's right. Okay, so that's probably a little bigger, a little bit bigger. All right, so that's my lab machine. So let's go take a look at what I just was, happened. I was going to ask and make sure that this isn't like a customer's network. Oh, <laughs> so, wait. So here we have a connection from uh, <laughs> Bank. Apparently, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I have a shelf to very large financial. <laughs> two birds with one stone. You wanted me to be more efficient, right? <laughs> That's not what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's go to Discover. And so, uh, if you've used the Elk stack before, if you or if you've used Kibana before, this should look kind of familiar. So basically, the the first page has a whole bunch of something going on, right? Um, so let's search for PowerShell in the last fifteen minutes. So in the last fifteen minutes, uh, I guess that could probably make this a little bit bigger too, right? All right, uh, please chime in if you're not able to read, because, uh, you know, sacrificing to the demo gods, uh, hopefully this all works right. So um, so I, I, I look for my PowerShell connections here, because the macro was a, a, a PowerShell-based macro. So uh, immediately, I see a script block log here. So if I look and see... So PowerShell running this big base64 encoded command, I, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that in most environments, this is probably not uh, a normal thing, right? Um, I don't know that users actually ever do this um, for a legitimate reason, but I know that attackers do it, and I certainly do it as a pen tester. So we were talking about this script block logging. Uh, so here is the actual script block log. Is this the one? Yeah, this is the one. So this is the decoded uh, uh, the decoded value, and so uh, here's a whole bunch of shell code that's uh, being put into memory. Yeah, um, that's probably not cool, right? So what do I do next? Uh, let's say that I now have a shell in your environment. Let's see. So net users domain. So I'm going to list all the users in the domain. Okay. Let's see if that got logged. Oh, yeah, there we go. Net users domain. So I logged a net command. How about uh, moving laterally? 
So no one's talking, so I don't know if like I dropped off. Or go, go, Derek, go. <laughs> no, we're good. That's the part part about webcast. Like, there's a lot of typing happening and not a lot of talking, so you feel like you're kind of alone. But wait, we're busy. Yeah, but people are like, people are like, we want to see more hands on because you know we could just throw this in slides, but I don't think it's as nearly as it's, cool. Yeah, it's it's so fun in slides, and you know, and and the talk I did at uh, RVA Sec. Um, yeah, I mean, putting logs into slides really sucks. Like, that's not. <laughs> I, I have I have the perfect solution. What we need is the super super loud key click. So while you're doing it, it goes. Yeah. You know what? I could just do that for you. So I already uh, preset this up to run, um, and uh, by a few Hollywood clips, right? <laughs> Sorry. Right. Right. So now you're so now you're pivoting through, right? That's using right. PSExec to uh, use your the hash with PSExec, or you got a password? No, you got the password. Uh, yeah. Summer 2017. Password. Okay. Well, that's that's your password, right? That's what I use for my passwords. Yes. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And it looks um, like your uh, 145 oh, wow. system here no. because, because I need to not, add a. Yeah. Here, hold my beer. And kind of the, you know, kind of while he's setting this up, I guess I can kind of talk to you. One of the big things that we're constantly trying to work out, I, I've been ripping on SIM for quite some time and ripping on event logs for quite some time. And people are like, how the hell should we actually do that? And to be honest, what we're trying to get across is you can actually do event logging, but you can do it intelligently. Um, kind of at the event log sources, the NSAs, and then the other one, uh, talking about what event IDs you should actually look for. And we have, I believe, the author of SANS 555, talking about event logging class from SANS. I, I can't remember what the full name of that course is, but someone's going to correct me very quickly. Um, they talk a lot about that, trying to reduce logs down to something that's manageable. It's also something they talk about in 5.11. and something we're talking about in SANS 504. So basically, a lot of this is built upon as pen testers and what we're doing. A lot of times, we tend to get ignored, and uh, probably justifiably so in many reasons. But a lot of times we're ignored because, well, what you're doing is a pen tester. That's what they would do. That's not what the real attackers would do. So here, log everything and let ArcSight tell you what's going on. So uh, I like the quote here. Jay just popped up and said, sim tactical analysis. That's kind of what we're talking about is we can actually do real-time analysis of all the processes that are kicking off. And I believe that, uh, Derek, you now have the logs up for your pivot, correct? Yeah, that's right. And I, I just wanted to add, I, I, I have uh, you know a friend who uh, you know was a big sim vendor trying to implement in their environment, and they wanted to basically just do this thing for a, a test. And the sim vendor, uh, and if he's on, he's probably laughing, uh, was insisting that no, 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 we need to add it all in for you to get value. No, and no, the security team was saying just what John said. No, we don't. We want to look at these things specifically. That's what we want to do, not all of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I'll also, so, also just to add to that comment, um, one of the things we haven't showed you yet and we'll show you in a minute is on the NX log configuration on the client side, we actually did some pretty deliberate filtering of the outbound events so that we could quell the fire hose a little bit because if you can imagine trying to scale this up, um, which I'm sure many of you are sitting there thinking right now, you want to be able to make sure that you're not just throwing everything at the uh, sim or the elk stack in this case because, well, again, along the lines of tactical analytics, we really don't want to throw everything at it. Thanks, JJ, by the way. That's an awesome term. Uh, and, what was it, John? Anyway. And correct me if I'm wrong. No, no, JJ. JJ coined that one. And correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but with this, this is basically logging every time a process starts. It's logging every time a network connection is made, correct? Yes, with, with the exceptions of what are excluded in the Sysmon file, the configuration uh -huh. file. So, and then there are some specific inclusions as well. So, the the uh, the Sysmon configuration file is pretty long. And uh, as I pointed out before, if you're going to actually implement this, you're gonna have to start whitelisting stuff. In fact, um, we created some visualizations uh, to demonstrate, and so. I have a command line visualization here, and actually it's showing me things that I probably would care about. Like I have a net users domain that was recently run. Wow, that's probably something I should look into, right? Um, but if I go, let's see. And I think that these visualizations and these dashboards are also important because it allows you to kind of see where the majority, the bulk of your uh, activity is happening, what processes are kicking off, but it also allows you to look for those outliers a lot faster as well. 
Well, yeah, so short and long tail analysis. So, uh, so uh, here's another visualization that I made with specifically net commands because as with Base64 encoded PowerShell, if I was hunting in an environment, I would really like to know like who's running net commands because um, there ought not be a whole lot of people who are doing that, right? Mm -hmm. So um, let's uh, maybe walk through a visualization, like how you create those. Um, so okay. I, I think that, uh, you know, Kibana is a little bit uh, hokey, uh, but I guess once you get the hang of it, maybe it's not so bad. Uh, so yeah. I'm going to create... I'm glad you guys did this. I liked it whenever it was just the raw logs, like you had your syslog server and it was popping up real time after everything that you did. And I'm like, that's perfect, but I know a lot of people, if they're just seeing raw logs, it's not all that exciting. It didn't have the cool visualizations or the sorting and everything. So Yeah, so that, so the NX log configuration actually, so you could do both, right? And maybe if you had the servers or the hardware to do both, that's the right approach to take, right? Because let's say you have to restart the, uh, the elk stack or something. You're going to miss those logs that were trying to come in. So maybe you ought to also send it to a syslog server and just log all the raw data just for archival purposes or for you know you know in case of blast break kind of thing. Uh, and then also I think that you know there's probably some things that Kibana would not do that you might want to do command line base right or you know that. String a, 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 together a whole bunch of uh, bash com commands is kind of you know kind of awesome I think but yeah, I'm with you I, I like the command line too but um, that that's just not as impressive for a webcast so here um, I'm selecting the win event uh, category and I'm going to look at for what's called terms and so I get all of my fields if I can actually click on it appropriately and then. Uh, let's do destination IP. Uh, we'll do it uh, by count, and let's look at the short tail ascending. And when I hit play, for some reason, it's going to tell me that. Uh, I, I and I'm not an elk expert. I have no what reason. I have no knowledge of why sorting by ascending order is deprecated, but it still works right now. So. And so here are the counts that I have right now of two IP addresses that were logged as a destination IP address in my lab environment. One was the lateral movement IP address, and then the other, this is my C2 server. So now that I have it as a visualization, I click Save. We'll call it DST IP. Click Save. Go to the dashboard. Say Edit. We'll add. Destination IP, click save. Oh, of course that didn't work. Let's try that again. That's the demo gods. So, so just while Derek's doing that, one of the other things that you're seeing uh, is the Sysmon event type uh, is part of the visualization, and that was the extra field I created inside of the log stash. Uh, configuration so that we could get a little more granularity uh, on, on the visualizations rather than just an event ID. Uh, we felt like it looked better in the visualizations. So that's something, an idea that could be expanded a little bit. Uh, if you feel like there are other fields inside of Sysmon's message content, you could easily uh, expand the um, uh, the the uh, grokking side of the configuration, right? Um, I see a number of questions coming in. Uh, maybe we can filter through those. Uh, Derek, did you get your visualization there? I did. So here is, you know, so now uh, let's say that I had that IP address as something that I thought, wow, in my environment, only four machines have talked to that IP address. That's kind of interesting. It doesn't mean that something's bad, but I can come over to the Discover tab and actually search. Also, Derek, before we uh, wrap up today, let's make sure that we show where the client side NX log configuration is. There was a question out there ah, for that. Yeah, actually, let's do that right now. So, uh, when you install NX log, um, you can pass it the configuration file at install. Um, and it's going to put it. In uh, C program files x86, uh, nxlog conf, 
And so, uh, no. And so here's the uh, configuration file that we were talking about earlier. And uh, the changer, the important part, uh, application log selecting specific events, uh, all of Sysmon, and then security logs and system logs selecting specific events. I mean, you could change that for whatever events that you want. And then as I was mentioning before, here's uh, going to the Elk stack server. You could also, even that's commented out here, you could send it to another syslog server, which, you know, if it was my environment, if it was my enterprise, I probably would want the, the syslog. Uh, I, I have more faith that uh, syslog is going to not go down uh, as opposed to Elk. Um, maybe that's just me. Uh, there was one question, uh, could we tweak the NX log to optimize straight to Elastic uh, for indexing? Um, I believe that is an option if you go beyond the community edition of NX log, but at the community edition level, um, I don't think that's available. If anybody has any different information on that, let me know, but that, that was my research on that question. <laughs> And Donald uh, talked about, he said, in all seriousness, if you have an amount of logging turned on in a production environment, how much traffic do you expect to see? This isn't that noisy. Um, I think that was the biggest thing that surprised me and why I thought this was, uh, I, I thought this was something that we needed to look into was it wasn't nearly as noisy as a lot of the other logging solutions that are out there. I mean, um, yeah. do you have the ability to actually look at the logs as they're coming in real time or is it dropping straight into Elasticsearch? And we well, can't, it's dropping, we can't it's dropping straight straight in, um, John. But we, yeah. you know, you could always just drop a TCP dump on there and just get a, a a broad metric sense on the logger end what's happening. But the key for that, though, as John is mentioning, is that there's double filtering going on here on the client side, and that's actually extremely important in order to be able to scale this appropriately. You know, there's filtering in that the Sysmon configuration is custom. Now, the custom on the Sysmon configuration is taken directly from Swift on security and just yeah. like huge props to those guys because they did a great job. And then on top of that, we have very specific filtering in this configuration file for NX log that is on the screen right now that, that filters it down to just specific event IDs of interest for all the other categories aside from Sysmon. We take everything from Sysmon in this config because we're leaning on the Sysmon configuration file to do the work there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when you talk about like both host and network-based performance, uh, like so I, I'm aware of a large environment that's essentially doing this to, to Syslog. Um, and you know, have, you know, let's say they have 25,000 endpoints. Um, you know, I think about, you know, based on what they have, uh, around, you know, 6,000 to 7,000 uh, endpoints per server, and, you know, hardware may vary, right? I mean, you're going to have to scale it. You're going to essentially have to figure it out. So one th if, if there's one thing I've learned as a, as a consultant is that everybody's environment is a special snowflake. I, it yeah. is amazing to me how different the same thing can be. Um, but, you know, it, it just, I think it depends, but I, I think, and, you know, if it was early 2000s, yeah, you're going to worry about a, a host or an agent that's on an endpoint. You're going to worry whether or not your backbone, your, your, your core router can handle like, you know, a 10% traffic load. I just don't think that's the case now. I, I think that, you know, if, if you're running where your core, you know, router is at 90% utilization and you can't afford the logging, then there's definitely something you need to do before you do this, and that's upgrade, right? But, and, the, and the other, you know, the other thing about that is you can scale out horizontally um, as you need to, right? You can separate, if you continue to use Logstash, just for a minute, you can separate the Logstash uh, process from the uh, Elasticsearch database, you can have multiple log stash collectors, and you can have multiple scaled out uh, elastic databases that communicate via multicast to scale up. So, so the scalability is there. It's just about doing the appropriate architecture work in your environment. I could imagine, for example, in very large, uh, you know, multinational uh, corporations that you might deploy one log stash collector, you know, per country and maybe have a very large cluster of elastic uh, in a central location and the log stash are bringing those things into the into the cluster or something similar to that, right? Yeah. What you're seeing here for the demo is most certainly a proof of concept, right? Everything sits on the same box. Yeah, we're, we're definitely not saying, hey, install this VM and log all your machines to it. Yeah, we know that's not gonna work, right? So um, if they were gonna, so a question is if they were going to set this up, 
how would you go about actually setting it up? Because you've kind of showed how everything is is kind of running together and it's all getting dumped into Elk and you got um, um, you got your config files. Can you go through each of the components and kind of where they sit? Like if somebody sure. is going to take from this webcast and try to set up what you guys did, I'm assuming almost everything's up on your Git page, right, Derek? Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, so, but we'll we'll walk through that. So uh, let's go to. Oh, actually, it's not that. It's not a local one. Actually, I'll go straight to the DC. So what I did is uh, on the syswall share. And this is on the domain controller, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Um, on the domain controller, uh, out where everyone can get to it, I uh, created a, a directory called scripts. And so I did it mm -hmm. slightly different than what you, you – the so – Joff took the two batch files that I had and made them into one because, you know, it has to be more elegant than two. But either way will work. Um, uh, so I, I separated it out because I like things separated out. Uh, so um, I created a batch file that essentially just uh, it copies the correct file in place. And, yeah, I know I have a duplicate here. I have to fix it. Um, still works though. I guess that's how I've done it throughout my career. Hey, it works. Let's go. Um, so uh, it's going to check and see if the, uh, the, the system, if the NX log service is running and if it's not, it's going to uh, 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 install it. And if it's installed, it's going to start it. And so this batch file and then the same thing with Sysmon, uh, there's a batch file for that. And both the executables and the configuration files are in the same directory. So if you consolidated it, you just have to put it into one directory. And so that, that's actually what you would want to do because the gist file or the, the batch file that we put out uh, in, in, in GitHub um, is going to consolidate both of these things. But it's the same kind of thing. It's going to check to see if it's installed, if the service has started, and if not, it's going to do those things. And then uh, what you do is... Well, actually, in a, uh, a real environment, you're probably going to go to your systems administrator and say, here, I want every machine to install this and check for new configurations, right? Um, uh -huh. If you're in a smaller environment, maybe you do it yourself. But uh, So there's uh, three GPOs that we created um, that essentially – so this one, let's see if I can remember the exact place, Windows uh, settings, scripts, yeah, so script startup, and so – I basically have a, a call to that batch file, and then it's an enforced, an enforced GPO. So right now in my lab environment, if any machine uh, um, can, uh, logs in or uh, starts up and doesn't have it installed, NX log and Sysmon, it's going to do that. Okay, so so far we have the, the script that you put. You've got the group policy that as soon as the system starts, it right. loads that script and it executes it. Make sure that it right. makes sure that it's running properly. Okay, what's next? So, so that the, that's the component. Really, that's it for the endpoint. It's going to start shoveling uh, data to wherever you tell it to shovel it. In my case, it's my dot seven machine, right? Okay, and that's um, your log stash machine that's going to be receiving the logs and throwing it into uh, Elasticsearch, correct? Yeah. So here, uh, so what we did for the uh, so. The logging server, we installed all three components, Logstash, Kibana, and Elasticsearch from the Debian package. And that's actually kind of important if you want to play with this, uh, because I tried from repo and I tried from source and was banging my head against the wall. And Joff said, why are you doing that? Just install from the Debian package. And then it worked. I don't know what the difference is, but hey, whatever. Um, hang on. Well, actually, I can. Okay, and you're on that system now, right? The, that is uh, the, correct. And that's just so that's just an apt dash get install like elk. Like you no, just go through. And go. In fact, that's ex that's not what you want to do. You want to go download um, the Debian packages from their site. Um, I know it sounds weird, but when I installed from repo, I was having troubles. Like it wasn't working. And then okay, yeah, I'm sure I could have figured it out, but I get impatient, and it was working another way. And that and don't you all just love the southern spelling of uh, Derek's syslog host? Syslog. Syslog. Right. There you go. Uh, and then so that configuration file for uh, Logstash um, uh, that's up on the uh, just site or the GitHub site too goes in Etsy Logstash conf d, right? 
Okay. So one other caveat. Uh, so actually, let's do less. Um, this actually threw me yesterday until Joff reminded me how stupid I was being. Um, so when you install Kibana, the ho it's gonna, that's going to be set to one two seven zero zero one, and you want to make that actual IP address of your system so that it's listening on the right uh, IP address. So those are really the only two changes that you will need to make to get it up and running. Okay. And then when you first go into Kibana, let's see if I can actually show this. I can get under management. So um, it's going to be a little bit different, but it's going to ask you uh, how to configure um, and it's going to default to log stash dash star. So in this case, you'll want to type in win event dash star and tell it to index, and it should just pop right up. Okay. So, so far, if we're looking at it, we have the script that you drop on uh, Sysvault Share. You have the group policy that automatically, as soon as the system starts up and joins the domain, it automatically runs the script to get it configured. You have the Elk system, which is running a base Debian, and it's got Elk installed. And you dropped two config files, if I remember correctly. You dropped two config files on the system uh, uh, for log config. Yeah, one config file for uh, log stash, and then one change to the kibana.yaml file. Okay. Um, and then uh, starting the services. Okay. And then you went into kibana and you selected management, and then you put in win event dash star. No, so sure it, right yeah, so uh, I've already done this on this system, so um, okay. I can't. No, that's fine. I, this probably, so it's going to pop up a screen that basically says, hey, I need to know what to index on. And you, instead of logs dash dash star, you're going to type win event dash, dash star and then you know, go to next. And, yeah, and, and just, just to chime in on, uh, you know, Derek and I do plan to write a detailed blog entry on this work um, yes. and publish that at Black Hills. Um, to to reinforce this webcast, so uh, yeah. I've seen a, a number of questions there on that. Cool. So that will be coming. So just kind of show you, hey, this looks cool, but we're going to give you step by steps as well. Yeah, exactly. And so um, you know, I, I hopefully with the blog post, this is you know with a decent server, this is an afternoon worth of work, right? And then you're collecting, you know, endpoint logs. And then really the hard part begins, right? You can go through and start creating filters for the things that you know. Like if you ever are so all of your systems in your environment mounting the exact same share every time they start up, you might want to put a filter in. Uh, maybe not to just make it all go away, but you put in some type of filtering so it doesn't show up on your dashboard. So kind of start going through what is happening on a regular basis to make sure that you're getting down to the interesting things like run DLL32 or your weird PowerShell processes that are kicking off and so yeah. on. And so, uh, in addition to the blog post, I think the rest of my year of like conference talks and things of that nature are essentially going to center around this. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm a pen tester. And I like the blue team. Um, so, I think I'm. I know I'm doing at least one in August in Virginia Beach at the Sands event, uh, and then um, uh, apparently I'm going to talk at Wild West Hackfest too with Joff, probably on this. Yeah, so um, expect improvements, like some shared dashboards. Um, I wanted to have that uh, done by today. It just, it just didn't happen. Um, so, but some shared dashboards, because you can export dashboards out of Kibana. Uh, that would be something really neat, I think. Uh, Had a question from John. He said, any recommended commercial products if you didn't want to use open source? I think at this point, you're, we're pretty much doing what something like Carbon Black would do, where it's basically logging all the processes in the parentage and... And it's basically, this is really a poor man's carbon black in some levels. Now, carbon black does a yeah. lot more of other things so, like whitelisting and things like that. But as far as tracking processes that are running, that would be the product I'd recommend. Yeah, I'd still go with uh, Sysmon. Um, and then you could always pay NX Log some money for some support. Because uh, I, I know that there are environments where management says, we're not using this open source stuff because we're not paying anybody for it. Like, sounds silly, but I have definitely seen that. Like, we have to have somebody that we're paying money for who cannot use it. And it doesn't matter if it's open source. It matters if it's free. So try and get Sysmon in. But uh, you could use, like, Syslog NG. Uh, you could go with Splunk uh, and, uh, you know, the Splunk forwarder and a Splunk install if you wanted to give them, uh, what is it, a bajillion dollars a terabyte? Like, I, I don't know. Um, but Yeah. 
uh, whatever. Uh, I mean, that, that, that's the beautiful thing, though, about the fact that it's decentralizing um, different products and different technology. I mean, you, you may make the choice to buy commercial NX log support so that you're happy with the endpoint side of things and, um, you know, do the rest on essentially as, as, as open source. You know, you can mix and match, which is, you know, that's yeah. the beautiful part about it. Yeah, I think the, the big takeaway that I want everybody to, to um, get is that if you're not logging in your Windows endpoints to a centralized location for you to hunt through to look for attackers, you, you need to be. And this is the type of logging, right? Somebody said, is, is, does regular logging detect what BHIS does in our pen test? And I think the answer to that question is pretty much a resounding no. If you're looking at just the standard event logs that are generated, you might get some service creation, uh, service deletion event logs that might trigger. But by and large, not really. Yeah. Um, with something and like this, how would you know? actually, yeah, I was just going to say one final thing. This is also something that we can give our customers in addition to commercial solutions, where you can say, hey, here's an idea on how you can do this type of process tracking. Um, on the cheap, because that's important for a lot of people too. Yeah, so yeah. I, I, I think, oh, sorry, Derek, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I, I know that I generate logs in various places as a pen tester. Absolutely. They're like, But if they're not going centrally and there's a thousand machines, nobody's going to know. Nobody's going to see it. Um, and, you know, even I've been, you know, in cases where, you know, like I did create a couple of uh, AV alerts. Nobody's paying attention. So that's the other key takeaway is somebody actually has to watch. Somebody has to be doing this. This, this doesn't help that problem. Um, if you have people <laughs> that are watching the event log, the logs and the alerts that are being generated. Hey, I think, you know, one of the other, the, one of the other real big takeaways here is the, the two most powerful logging features on the client side that um, really are enabling this is is Mark Rosinovich's uh, Sysmon. That's fantastic uh, piece of work. And then making sure that you enable uh, script block logging uh, inside of PowerShell, which means you have to go to PowerShell 5, Windows Management Framework 5. And doing those two things is really not that difficult. Uh, and it gives you such a huge uh, opportunity for, for um, more visibility that, that um, you can use for hunting. Oh yeah, there's my, my, my spreadsheet that I ran. Oh cool, and this, was a, this was the macro spreadsheet that you got a uh, reverse connection out of, right? Yeah, that's right. Cool. Thank you so much everybody. It's time to get off to other calls and other things. Thank you so much for coming to another Blue Team presentation. I think Derek and Joff did a fantastic job. Woo! And I think our next webcast is, is, it, is there a next webcast me in DC? I think it, no. Our next webcast is with Jordan and Kent. Oh, what are they cooking up now? They're doing more internal network review. Oh. Fantastic. So, so more know, webcasts coming. Should be and, good. And notice we didn't sell your information to any vendors. Yeah, uh, we, yeah. we don't do that. Yeah, that's not that's not that's, the way we roll. Here. So yeah. So, uh, uh, but we're going to continue spamming you. No, I'm joking. No, no, oh, no, they're, no, no, They're like they're like heartfelt letters it's, it's, from me exactly. to you. Like, here, come to this free webcast. It'll be awesome. All right. Thanks again, everybody. Talk to you all later.